Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for this special edition of Colorado Gives Day coverage. We're so grateful to all of you who've tuned in throughout the day starting at 9 o'clock. You got to hear a special interview with our director for the Institute for Science and Policy, Kristen Muhlenbrock, at 10 a.m. We showed you a little uh, Museum Rewind edition of our date night reality bites, and we got to take you behind the scenes of the Institute's recent symposium, where you got to hear a keynote speech. So today we are taking you through some of the highlights of this very strange year 2020 and all of the things that we as a museum have done to support you our community and thank you of course for you supporting us you all have done such a tremendous job of keeping us really just excited to continue serving you this year your donations your gifts allow everything that we do here at the museum to be possible we really couldn't do this without you so today's museum rewind is not only to celebrate everything that we've accomplished this year it's to celebrate everything that you our donors and our community have accomplished too so today we have another exciting edition an exciting installment this time i'm connected to dr tyler leeson he's the curator of vertebrate paleontology Oof, what a title here at the denver museum of nature and science now you have probably seen Tyler on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, all a whole bunch of times throughout the last several months because he's had some exciting stuff to talk about. Uh, now, back in October of 2019, Tyler and uh, Dr. Ian Miller and some of our other colleagues uh, here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science made scientific history. There was a study published in, was it Nature? Um, help me get science that one right. Science Oh, well, you know, nature <laughs> and science. I'm always thinking about both of those. <laughs> Uh, one of the really, really, uh, you know, preeminent scientific journals really rewrote the textbooks, the history books for how we think about life on Earth and how it recovered after that massive asteroid slammed into the Yucatan Peninsula and wiped out the dinosaurs and how the mammals, that's us, then rebounded. So Tyler has been in the news. You were on NPR. I got to listen to you on my commute in one morning. That was pretty fun. And of course, you've been part of some exciting virtual programming lectures, events over the last several months. But we maybe don't know a whole lot about you as a human being. So we're gonna talk a little bit to Tyler today. Uh, and then after that, we will get to show you one of the lectures that Tyler gave over the last several months entitled After the Asteroids. So today we're jumping into paleontology. Who doesn't love a little fossil break while you're eating your lunch? And with that, let's go ahead and jump in. So Tyler, we all know you're a paleontologist. And I think when a lot of people think paleontologists, they think dinosaurs but paleontology is not just the study of dinosaurs and you in fact are really interested in some other ancient vertebrates. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe how you became a paleontologist and what is it about those creatures you love so much that gets you excited? Yeah, thanks Talia, thanks uh, everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, yeah, so paleontology is just an amazing field. I have always said I have the best job in the world because I get to study ancient life. So it's not just dinosaurs. A lot of people think paleontology is just dinosaurs, but it's actually the study of all ancient life. Uh, you know, but you know, dinosaurs are certainly what draws a lot of us to the field. And I have to confess that uh, even myself, I was drawn to paleontology through uh, dinosaurs. Um, because I grew up in southwestern North Dakota in a town of about uh, 80 people. And sort of, you know, in, in the middle of, of nowhere. It's a beautiful area. I love going back home in, in, in North Dakota, but it was right in the middle of dinosaur country. Um, it was, it preserves Earth's last dinosaur ecosystems. Like dinosaurs like Triceratops and T-Rex and duckbill dinosaurs. And so as a kid, I would go out with my uncle uh, who would be checking his cows or we'd go look for for arrowheads or just run around, just do, do what kids do out there. And I was always looking on the ground, you know, looking for fossils. And uh, so that's how I, you know, got interested in, the, in paleontology. Uh, but then later, and I guess when I was about in high school, I really started to move a little bit away from the dark side, you know, of dinosaurs. And I started to become more interested in, in other animals. And one of the groups of animals that I was really fascinated with and continue to be fascinated by are turtles. I mean, turtles are just these bizarre animals. Uh, there's nothing, you know, like a turtle alive today or extinct. I mean, turtles are just so incredibly unique. Um, so I was always just fascinated about, you know, basically how the turtle came to be, you know, the origin of the turtle shell, um, who turtles are related to. 
Uh, so anyway, that is actually what I went and did my PhD on and my postdoc, and I still continue to mostly write papers on, uh, on turtles with a few dinosaur papers sprinkled in for fun. You gotta, you gotta do some dinosaurs <laughs> every so often, but it's really important, I think, to remember that, yeah, the study of ancient life is not just the study of dinosaurs. I'm sure our curator, Dr. Sertich, would say, yeah, dinosaurs are all that matters, but, you know, he's not the only one with a say here. Um, you've been doing some really incredible and fascinating work reconstructing these ancient ecosystems. You know, none of us know exactly what the Earth was like 66 million years ago or 65 million years ago or even in the time periods leading up to today. But through fossil evidence, we can sort of put that puzzle together. And that's exactly what Tyler does. And one thing I do just want to call out, we have to share this on Colorado Gives Day, is that Tyler's path to becoming a scientist, Dr. Leeson's path to becoming this, you know, amazingly published and really widely regarded expert in, in turtle paleontology and these ancient ecosystems started when he was only a kid. And so today on Colorado Gives Day, we do just want to remind everybody that your gifts today do support virtual programming for kids, for students in their classrooms, for families with kids at home, for adults who just, you know, want to learn some science because science does not, you do not stop being a dinosaur enthusiast when you graduate from high school, when you hit adulthood. I certainly have not. And of course, our paleontologists haven't either. You know, your gift today goes to support virtual programming for everybody, everybody who's part of the museum's community. So make sure that you give today. You can go to coloradogives.org backslash DMNS to make your gift today. We've raised almost $40,000 today out of our gift for 50, or our, our goal today is $50,000. We only have about 10 grand to go. We hope that you'll contribute. So Tyler, you made this really amazing discovery a couple of years ago, and I say a couple of years ago because it was only released a year ago. You had to sit on that secret for a long time. So what I'd love for you to talk about next is A, what is that discovery that you made just in case anybody hasn't heard already? What does it show us about the history of life on earth? How did you make this discovery? And then what was it like to keep that secret? <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, I was so incredibly fortunate to be to be part of this amazing discovery. Um, you know, one of the things that we one of the things that I study is Earth's last mass extinction, when a you know asteroid about six miles wide slammed into Earth. It was lights out for the dinosaurs, and it was in that moment it was the origin of the modern world. That's when mammals really took off. So in North Dakota, I studied that interval leading up to the mass extinction, because that's the best place in the world to understand what killed the dinosaurs. But we didn't know what happened next. We just didn't have a fossil record. Uh, you know, I've been looking for fossils since I was a small child, um, and I've been looking for, for uh, fossils you know, uh, before the mass extinction, as well as after that mass extinction for about 25 years now. And I can count on one hand how many mammal fossils that I found from after the mass extinction, from the, from the really the origin of the modern world. And so when I got a job here six years ago, I was talking with uh, my boss, Ian Miller, uh, who studies plants, and he's interested in this mass extinction as well. And we were talking, you know, back and forth, like, oh, well, we're, you know, what are the big scientific questions out there? You know, because we're young, you know, young-ish, uh, eager scientists, and we, we thought, what happened after the dinosaurs went extinct? That first 1 million years when mammals really took off, we just knew nothing about. So we said, that's what we're going to target. And so we figured we're gonna go somewhere, somewhere in the world we knew we'd find these fossils. And so we kind of rolled out the maps and we thought we were gonna to go to Bolivia and we we're gonna go here, we're gonna go all to all these places, you know, to make this discovery. And we thought, well, before we, we do that, maybe we should look in our own backyard. Because right here in Denver, as many of you guys are probably familiar with, we have an amazing fossil record. It seems like every time uh, a new construction site is going on, we get a phone call about the discovery of a new dinosaur. You know? um, and so we have, we have that moment in time preserved, the extinction interval, and then right after that extinction interval of what happened next. So we went down to Colorado Springs, because this was an area where scientists had been looking for at least 100 years. It was a known area. So that's kind of what you do as a scientist, come up with the question, and then go to an area, as a paleontologist, go to an area where fossils have been found. And we didn't really expect to find much, but uh, 
you know, we figured we needed to at least go look because this is one of those areas where fossils had been found. And you got to check. You, you got to check before you get on that plane and fly, you know, halfway around the world. And so that's what we were, we were really doing. And uh, there'd been a couple of fossils found from this area that were pretty, pretty complete. Uh, some found by some of our own, the very own volunteers. And I remember walking around the Badlands, uh, the bluffs, the area called Corral Bluffs, and just not finding a whole lot, being pretty disappointed, but being just happy that I was outside and looking for fossils and thinking, like, God, they have to be here. The fossils have to be here. And then I thought, well, maybe the fossils are inside of a type of rock called a concretion. Um, this is, I, I work in South Africa as well on some of my early turtle work. And down there, they look for fossils by zeroing in on a certain type of rock or a concretion and then breaking open the concretions. So pretty, pretty simple stuff. But uh, um, so I remember, you know, thinking like, well, maybe, maybe it's concretion. So we go, I, I remember, still remember, it was uh, you know, September 10th, 2016. I picked up the first concretion, kind of an ugly white blob of a rock. And I took my rock hammer and I cracked it open. And it was just a complete thrill because the mammal was, was looking back at me. And uh, it was, you know, just a, 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 such a, an incredible moment in my career that I'll, I'll never forget. And I remember calling uh, the volunteers over and Ian and, and showing them what I had found. And we were just, couldn't believe it. We just had never seen a fossil that complete from this interval. Um, and while I was like tending to my, my fossil and like, gluing it and whatnot, Ian goes around the corner and Sharon, our volunteer, goes around the corner. And within 30 minutes, they both come back carrying little mammal skulls. And in the years since then, we've, we've found hundreds of these things. Uh, you know, whereas before we only had a handful uh, of, again, really broken, some really, really broken fossils to now having whole skulls and skeletons. Um, it was an absolute thrill. Um, did you know, you know, what, what were the first thoughts that went through your head when you first cracked open that concretion? Did you know this was going to be big or was there a moment of, oh, maybe this is something I don't quite know? I knew as soon as I had broken open and I could see the mammal and I could see the teeth because you, again, I'd been looking for fossils from this interval for 25 years, knowing that if we could find fossils from this interval of time, there would be an incredible story to tell because nobody had told that story. We just didn't know what that story was. The problem is we just didn't find, have the fossils. And so when I found them, and then especially when the volunteers started coming back, you know, or, or, you know Ian and, and uh, uh, some other folks that were with me, they started finding them. And that first week, it was just magical because we were finding just literally skull after skull after skeleton after skeleton. And, uh, and that discovery continues today. We are still out there uh, right now uh, looking for fossils and finding amazing, uh, amazingly complete fossils. So it's, it's definitely the, the, the discovery of a lifetime. You do have the, uh, at least one of the coolest jobs in the building. I have a pretty cool job too, but you definitely, definitely yeah. one of the coolest <laughs> jobs in the whole building. Definitely and one, competition. Little here, one little plug I do want to make is that part of how we have been able to share this incredible discovery with the whole world is through the power of virtual programs. And again, we've said this a million times today, but we're going to say it again because wow, we, we just need to hammer this point home. This is what you're supporting today. The need for virtual programs, um, and I'm, I'm getting some notifications saying, yes, we've crossed 40K, that's so exciting. We're so close to our goal for the day, yes. Um, you know, your, your donations today, your gifts support the virtual programming that allows us to share this discovery with the world. We've been able to share this with students across the country uh, as part of our Scientists in Action program. I actually got to go down to the dig site with Tyler and Dr. Ian Miller. It was so much fun. Uh, we've gotten to bring this to um, our lecture series. We've gotten to bring this to families, to our community, to adults watching at home through the power of virtual programs. So if you feel so inclined, please make a donation today. Part of Colorado Gives Day, your donation, your gift will go to support the kinds of virtual programming that is only becoming more important in this year, 2020, and possibly into the future. So we need to hear from you today. Now, and we I are would add on top of that, though, that the, the, those donations also help the work that we do. They make the discoveries 
like at Corral Bluffs, the, 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 the finding of the fossils, the cleaning of the fossils, and the studying of these, you know, amazing fossils possible through everybody's donations as well. That's right. So your gift today matters in a lot of different ways, not just in helping us share the amazing science that we're doing with the world through the power of virtual programming, but also helping that science actually happen. So again, we need to hear from you today, coloradogives.org backslash BMNS. And don't forget, if you submit a grievance, a complaint about 2020 with your donation, maybe for you, Tyler, it's that you haven't been able to go out and do field work quite as much as you would have liked. I know a lot of scientists are feeling that way. We'll destroy it with science live on Facebook at 4 p.m. So make sure you submit that grievance with your donation. You might see us smash something with that complaint written on it. So we are close to the end of our time. You know, I could continue talking to you about this forever. But I think a couple of last things that I'd like you to think about is what, what has happened since you made this amazing discovery? You know, what are you working on now? What have we done with these fossils to help sort of tell the story of how the earth rebounded? And if you're curious about how exactly that happened, Stay tuned. Remember, we're going to share one of Tyler's lectures after the asteroid, immediately after our interview, and then what comes next. So what have you done since, and then what's next for you? Yes, so we published this big paper, you know, in October of 2019, and uh, it was truly an amazing experience to publish in science. Uh, we had a documentary come out called The Rise of the Mammals. Um, but even with that big, dis, uh, big paper, we're, you know, we're really just beginning. We've literally just scratched the surface because uh, we're still, you know, finding the fossils. I've got a team out there today looking for uh, fossils, so we're still finding amazing fossils. We're still cleaning the fossils, and then one of the really cool things that we're doing now is we're sending all the fossils out to get CT scans. You know, using com computed tomography scans to sort of peer inside to look at the size of their brains and their ears to really bring these uh, these animals back to life. Um, our team of scientists grew like that because as soon as the paper came out, we had people from around the world uh, getting in touch with us, uh, wanting to collaborate on different projects. So uh, our, our, the fossils from this locality are helping to support uh, undergraduate, uh, uh, graduate students, postdocs, early career scientists. So we're really hoping to, you know, to help boost a lot of scientific uh, careers with uh, with this uh, particular um, discovery. So there's just, there's just so much um, to be done. It's, uh, it, it is overwhelming and it is just so, so exciting because there's going to be a lot of great uh, discoveries that we're going to, that you're going to see in the hope, hopefully not so distant uh, future. Fingers crossed. Yeah, we will, <laughs> we will share them with you as soon as we possibly can. Of course, the science continues. And as our colleague, Ian, Dr. Ian Miller loves to say, he was again, part of this big discovery too. The best fossils are still in the grounds. So there is still a lot of great science to come and everyone, your gifts, your donations, your support of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science makes a difference. We are so grateful for everyone who has contributed over $40,000 already today. That's only $10,000 away from our $50,000 goal. Maybe we can even surpass that today. It's only just past noon. We've still got a lot of time. Your gifts support the science that is yet to come, the science that's happening right now, and of course, the communication that's happening too, to share these discoveries with the world. I think we're going to go ahead and end our interview. You've been so wonderful to talk to today, Tyler. Thank you so much for being here. And we're going to bring up a special lecture that Tyler did just these past few months, all about this incredible discovery. So if you're curious, you want to know exactly how the Earth rebounded after the asteroid, stay tuned, because we'll bring you that in just a minute. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good afternoon and welcome to Science Division Live. My name is Alyssa Carlson and I'm a program specialist and your host for today's chat. Today I'm joined by Drs. Tyler Lyson and Ian Miller of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And during their talk, I'll be watching for any questions you have here on Facebook. Um, hopefully we can find some time to answer a few of those questions at the end of their chat. Other than that, I'll be behind the scenes, but if you have any questions or any problems, just let us know in that chat and I'll take care of it. All right, I'm gonna pass it over because this is gonna be a quick talk. So all right, Ian and Tyler, can you tell us what you do at the museum and what is up with this new discovery about after the asteroid? Thank you, Alyssa. Um, can you guys see me on the other end? I think so, okay, great. <laughs> well, my name is Ian Miller and I'm um, 
uh, Tyler Leeson and I, are both scientists at the museum, are going to tell you this incredible uh, story of extinction and recovery, uh, about a discovery that we made last year. And we're just going to give you sort of the tip of the iceberg, about five or seven minutes each. And then we're going to open it up to questions, as, as Alyssa said. So to kick us off here, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, uh, let's see here. I've got a million windows open. Um, OK. And so let's see if we get this to work. OK. So. Um, so what we're going to tell you is a story about after the great asteroid that killed the dinosaurs and this discovery that really rocked the world here, we think, in Colorado. So to set the stage, um, here's a, uh, a graph showing you the diversity of life over the last 600 million years. So along the bottom there is, uh, uh, is time, uh, starting 600 million years ago, and then along the, the vertical axis, the um, uh, is the number of families. You can think of that as the, as the diversity or the number of different kinds of critters on the landscape. And you see how that graph moves from the left to the right, that it has all these jagged marks in it. Those are extinctions. Those are the times when life uh, took a big hit and then recovered afterwards. And really the story of how all life got to the present day is the story of extinction and recovery. And I really want to Want you to think of extinction sort of like this. So you can see um, on the left-hand side a pre-extinction world, uh, it's, it's sort of a branching tree. So that uh, that diagram you see there is all the branching diversity of life, and then that red line is the extinction, and it clips off lots of different kinds of life, and that could be, you know, different kinds of ecologies or different uh, styles like styles of living or even different critters itself themselves. But whatever makes it through those few lines that make it through the red, the big red bar, become the things that diversify in the world afterwards. So extinction is both a time of loss, but also a time for the origination of new life on Earth. So I want to take you back to the last great mass extinction in Earth's history. This happened 66 million years ago, and probably many of you know that's when the dinosaurs go extinct. And we were hit by a giant space rock moving about 150,000 kilometers an hour. It smashed into the Yucat what is now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and blew a hole in the ground 180 kilometers across, 20 kilometers deep. It liquefied the surface of the earth and made a, it was like a rock dropping into water and had a little drip or like a you know, when you drop a rock, you we'll see a resurgence um, yeah, of water. And that uh, was about the height of Mount Everest, so a mountain yeah, yeah. So size of Mount Everest in the middle for a few yeah, yeah, minutes. Of course, of course. It went, shock waves went from Mexico to Alaska in five minutes. Um, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable catastrophe. And that served to eradicate the dinosaurs. So here's just a kind of a fun image um, of what we think maybe Colorado looked like a minute after the asteroid impact as the shockwave and firestorm came north. And here's Tyrannosaurus rex and, and Triceratops, both dinosaurs at the end of the um, that would have seen this unbelievable moment in Earth's history uh, in which we're hit by this giant asteroid. So what do we know? We know that um, at that moment, we had this unbelievable diversity of dinosaurs, all those sort of faded out images there, living in a Cretaceous world. This is a picture of actually Tyler's backyard um, where the dinosaur, many dinosaurs fossils come from. And there are no dinosaurs above that line. Above that line that marks the moment the asteroid hit. Um, and so we know we went from a world like this, this unbelievably diverse world, this dinosaur world. Here's two amazing critters called uh, Anzu wileyi and a, and, a, and a dance here. And they lived in a forest that was incredibly diverse, tons of different animals and plants. These are the last moments of the Cretaceous. The asteroid hits and we go to a world like this. It's very devoid of a diversity of life. Just those things that are very good at surviving environmental um, disasters make it through. So the ferns and a few other things, you can actually see a crocodile sort of really tiny there in the middle. And so, but we know that everything alive today, the amazing diversity of life that we see today, the plants, the animals, the birds, the insects, the fungi, and so on and so forth, 
all had ancestors that made it through the last great mass extinction. They all had ancestors that made it through that asteroid impact. And so the diversity of life today and what life looks like today is a result of that big asteroid impact and extinction 66 million years ago. So we knew how the dinosaurs went extinct. So here's a triceratops, it's skeleton. But what we really haven't known much about is how does life rebound in that first about a million years after the asteroid impact. So um, even though we know that life is diverse today and we see all the different things and we start tracing them back to these early ancestors, we don't know much, and in some cases nothing at all, about those first animals and plants that made it through the extinction and began to diversify. And so here's a picture showing little marsupials and probably placental mammals, uh, our big group of mammals, uh, living on top of this triceratops skull. So what we knew before was just little stuff like this. So this is actually an incredible fossil find from after the boundary. It's just a little chunk of a jaw and we would be able to put whole animals back together from this little chunk uh, in this little chunk of a fossil. This would have been an incredible fossil, but this is what we knew. So you can imagine we have very fragmentary information from this critical interval, from the things that made it through and began to diversify that led to the incredible diversity of life today. So Tyler and I are both um, uh, um, paleontologists and we work in this time period. And he and I, uh, when we started working together about five years ago, set out to work on this problem. This problem has actually been standing for about a hundred years in paleontology. And we looked around the world and across the American West and we were drawn to this one place outside of Colorado Springs. And here's a shot of it. That's Pikes Peak in the background. It's called Corral Bluffs. And it has the right age rocks and a few scraps of fossils have been found there. And we thought we'd go take a look and see if we could make a discovery down there that might shed some light on this problem. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it to Tyler and he's gonna finish up our presentation. Okay. Hello, Facebook world. Okay, so paleontologists have known about uh, Corel Bluffs uh, and fossils from Corel Bluffs for quite some time. Here's a picture from uh, the Smithsonian's expedition in the early 1930s and 1940s where they documented highly fragmentary fossils, much like the fossils that uh, Ian just showed you. And um, our own museum has been working in this particular area for at least the last 25 years or so. But the area is, is, is geographically quite small and the fossils were highly fragmentary, which is typical for this interval of time. So the area was, uh, was largely ignored. Uh, so Ian and I started to think about this problem and uh, we thought that maybe we just weren't seeing the fossils. We weren't using the right search image. We weren't keying in on the right things. So we went out back uh, to, uh, to Corral Bluffs and rather than keying in on the fossils themselves, the fossil bone, we started keying in on these locks called concretions. So here's a concretion. And we thought that uh, like other areas in the world, where fossils are found inside these concretions that this interval of time might have fossils uh, preserved in these concretions. And we cracked some of these open and we, we were absolutely stunned to find complete mammal skulls and complete uh, skeletons of these animals preserved inside of these concretions. This really was our aha moment. Uh, within a matter of an hour, we very quickly picked up five mammal skulls, and within a, a week, we picked up about 20 skulls from this interval of time, whereas before we only had fragments. So concretion by concretion, we revealed this uh, whole skulls and skeletons of mammals, turtles, crocodiles. This entire ecosystem was trapped inside, again, these sort of ugly, nondescript looking rocks or concretions. Here we have new species of mammals, turtles, as well as uh, crocodiles. And not only do we have an amazing vertebrate record, uh, fossil record from this interval of time, Ian and his team uh, collected over 6,000 plant fossils from, uh, for, uh, uh, that were living alongside these mammals and uh, turtle and crocodile fossils. 
So we have an amazing vertebrate record as we also have an amazing plant record. But not only that, we also were able to date the rocks in which the fossils uh, were found. So this allowed us to very precisely date every single plant fossil, over 6,000 plant fossils, and all of the vertebrate fossils, well over 1,000 vertebrate fossils. So this is like what, what, what we have coined uh, the trifecta of paleontology. It's sort of having the entire picture uh, at our fingertips. So what did this tell us about the recovery of life after Earth's last mass extinction event? Well, this is what we knew before. We knew that uh, a giant asteroid struck Earth right around 66 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. But what we didn't know a whole lot about, like Ian had said, is we didn't know what happened afterwards until now. And so the first thing that we were able to do was use this amazing vertebrate fossil record, all these great skulls, to reconstruct the body mass. So body mass is one size of, or one proxy of recovery of an ecosystem. And so we we're really able to address, like, when did mammals get big uh, after the extinction of the dinosaurs? And we found that within about 100,000 years after the mass extinction, we had mammals that were just about as large as before the extinction. You can sort of see that little jump uh, in step uh, there by Loxolophus. So here's an animal about the size of a raccoon that's living in the landscape 100,000 years after the extinction event. And it's just about as large as be the mammals before that mass extinction event. And we also noticed two pretty big jumps in body size at 300,000 and 700,000 years after the mass extinction as well. To get back to that here in a minute, we we used uh, the uh, the plants uh, and the pollen record that Ian oops and, and team collected to. Uh, oh, can I go back? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, we, we used that to really reconstruct this ancient ecosystem of uh, uh, to, to paint these vivid pictures of what the ecosystem looked like moving from um, Earth's last dinosaurs here. Uh, you know, where the ecosystem was dominated by large um, dinosaurs and were, these were living in really diverse forests. To the single worst day on, uh, single worst day for multicellular life on earth when a giant rock struck earth, completely wiped out the dinosaurs. This is the biologic reset button. And in the immediate aftermath of this world, we found a world completely dominated by ferns. This fern world lasted for a hundred to a, maybe a couple thousand years. And in the understory of this fern world, we had the, the animals that survived this mass extinction, including the largest mammal to survive the mass extinction, which is about the size of a rat, uh, which you can see here in the bottom part of your screen, uh, as well as the largest animal that survived the mass extinction. And that is a large softshell uh, turtle that weighed a couple hundred pounds. This world was replaced by a palm dominated world. Uh, the forests were completely dominated by palms. And in the understory of this palm forest, the mammals begin to diversify. Uh, this forest was replaced in about 300,000 years by a forest that was slightly uh, more diverse. And the forests were, were diversifying. One of the key groups that diversified was the walnut family, which includes the pecan pie. And in this exact same moment, uh, we had mammals that, that jumped up in size considerably. There was a 30-fold increase in body size compared to the mammals that survived the, uh, the mass extinction. And so we dubbed this the pecan pie world the diversification of the walnut family, as well as this big increase in body size. And then at 700,000 years, the forest continued to diversify. Uh, one of the key findings we found with the, with the forest was the, the first appearance of legumes or bean pods. Right here in Colorado, uh, Ian and his team found the world's oldest bean pod. And beans are, of course, um, rich in protein. And so we dubbed this the protein bar world because, in a, again, in that exact same interval of time, uh, 700,000 years after the mass extinction, we see mammals, uh, the largest mammals from our research area, about the size of a, of a wolf. Uh, and this is a hundredfold increase in body size compared to the mammals that survived the mass extinction. And so 
this is a, a great summary of, of, uh, of our discovery. Um, uh, me and Ian, as well as 14 other folks describe or published this, this discovery in the scientific journal called Science. Uh, we worked with the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Tangled Bank Studios, as well as PBS Nova, to create a one hour a documentary called Rise of the Mammals, which you can stream uh, online now at pbs.org. And then we worked with museum professionals at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to create this a wonderful exhibit uh, after the asteroid, uh, which I'd encourage you to uh, go and visit once the museum uh, opens back up. Uh, but in the meantime, you can go, if you wanna learn more, you can go to the website, uh, coloradosprings.dmns.org to, uh, to learn more about this incredible discovery. And with that, I'd just like to leave you with a one minute clip of the, uh, the PBS Nova documentary that I think really uh, sums up the excitement as well as the importance of this particular discovery. So enjoy. Oh man, Tyler, I don't think we have audio on your video. Oh, really? Yeah, can you unplug your headphones and see if we can just play it through the computer and try again? Say again, stop share. Can you unplug your headphones and just play it through? through? There's just nothing like picking up something and finding out it's something amazing. It was crazy the way it happened. Bam. Yeah, we hit a bag. I just found a mammal skull. <laughs> it was like opening a door into a new world. We want to build up a picture of how life evolved in this period. Some things survive, right? Including some of our earliest, earliest ancestors. Over the last 66 million years, mammals evolved in incredible diversity of forms. That moment of rapid mammal evolution is effectively the trigger to our existence here on planet Earth. All right, thank you. Thank you guys, that was awesome. We do have some questions from Facebook. I think we have a few minutes to take some of those, maybe two questions. Um, we have a bunch of questions about your concretions that you found. Um, so I think to put all these questions together, have you ever found fossils and concretions before this discovery? And how did that change biology or paleo, paleontology? Um, and what was the ratio of concretion to just a rock? That you found. Yeah, so uh, we, we do find concretions and fossils and concretions in, in other rock units. Uh, in fact, it's the most common way you find fossils in marine environments, in you know, ancient seas and whatnot. But concretion, fossils and concretions in land-based environments are actually quite rare. Um, and so that was the real breakthrough was when we realized that in this land-based environment that we could find these fossils inside of these concretions. I think that was a real surprise to us as well as a lot of other paleontologists uh, around the world. Um, and we're hoping that this sort of new search image or this new lens will, will sort of break open other areas and, and folks will start finding fossils from this critical interval of time uh, as well. Um, Mother Nature tends to repeat herself, so we know or we think that, that uh, this type of preservation will be found elsewhere in the world. And then maybe about, uh, to answer the other part of the question, maybe one in about 200 of the actual concretions have fossils, uh, vertebrate fossils inside of them. So not every concretion actually has a fossil inside of it. Whoa, that's amazing. One in 200, I would just be out there with my hammer. <laughs> you do, you gotta, you gotta break a lot of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. All right, uh, how large was your crew and how long did it take you to actually prepare all of the specimens that you guys found? 
Um, so our crew is, is actually quite large. So we go out with teams of people into the field, mostly um, uh, a few select volunteers and um, uh, lots of interns and other staff members. And the field work is usually a team of, of eight to 10 people. But the team expand, or extends so far beyond that. So there's a, a really big team of scientists that are working on this. The initial set of scientists was about 16, but it's grown well beyond that as uh, people work on different aspects of, um, of the project and take it in new directions. Um, we estimated that we spent about 10,000 hours in the field collecting fossils to get ready for this first discovery. Uh, across our team. So it, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of dedicated effort, but uh, the payoff is huge for us to get a glimpse into this moment uh, that we've never really been able to, to see before, to see these earliest ancestors in the plant and animal kingdoms uh, uh, that gave rise to much of what is alive today. I think you're muted, Alyssa. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> yep. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so you might have to say that again. Yeah. yeah. I bet you guys can't wait to get back out there um, and see what else you can find. And I can't wait to see what it is um, back at the museum. So thank you guys so much for joining us. I think we're about at the end of our time for this segment, but we hope you, um, everybody on Facebook, joins us again next week for another science division live right here on facebook thank you to tyler and ian for joining us today great thank you everybody appreciate it thanks guys see you later bye